，我哋而家够钟开翻。Okay, it's time. Next, Mr. Lam Yucheng. Like to follow up on Mr. Lam Chuckting question on the dissemination information to villagers. Well,、uh, they have been explored and hope that things can be improved. And I just talked to the social workers. They told me the inf information are not timely and comprehensive. They are waiting for the government officials to improve the communication. I want you to look into how to get the information released to ASAP and to the villagers. So I asked earlier. Unless in very special circumstances, by your estimate, the no residents will need to live in built-in interim estate. Well,、uh, it's actually not the case. I、uh, relate your answer, villagers. That last department have notified a lot of villagers that need to go to live at built-in. Is for the Chongyun、uh, village. Uh, households, if not, said so. Well,、um, how do we address this inadequate housing environment? If the household are to be rehoused in temporary shelter or interim estate, or will we、uh, there were a few situations. One of them would be the structure they living in. Is not a registered squatter, even though as a small number of cases, and explain to other members, we believe such cases do exist. As far as we know, if those affected by phase one, there are some of these squatters that are completely illegal structures, and these we need to、uh, safeguard our policy. If they're not registered squatter, there would not be special. Uh, compensation and rehousing arrangements. We don't hope to encourage that different people and、uh, to、uh, build illegal structures. Whether you encourage or not, this is a historical legacy which you cannot discredit. But the squatter division had not stopped them, or evict them, and tolerate them. That's a historical legacy. So you just can't say、uh, they're illegal and、um, toss them out. And then the villagers have told you, and the government is dis and discussing on transition housing. Wonder、uh, they have a prototype fourteen、uh, nearby plots to build some transition housing before they can be rehoused. You know,、uh, to live somewhere、uh, they're not familiar with, as and even harder for families. Can we take the transition housing approach? Instead of、uh, rehousing them at built-in interim housing for the ineligible household, if they have other needs, would only、uh, take a compassionate approach. However, if they insist on、uh, built transitional housing northern district, that it will even、uh, may、uh, give a better treatment than the re. Housed households for the ineligible household for rehousing with LACCO、uh, approval. Well, as long as they're affected by the government clearance, regardless of the excuse,、uh, not able to get rehoused or get the、uh, domestic removal allowance, they were giving the、uh, basic or、uh, modest、uh, removal allowance. Uh, Mr. Lau Kuo Fan, for any NTD squatter policy, you need a major overhaul. And last year, you come up with a new squatters regime. Well,、uh, if you have a dispute when you have a new development, then people will get anxious. So、uh, we need to.、Uh, To tweak, we have to understand how the government decided to stand firm on the policy. 
for the land resumption and demolition and clearance, while the uh, house, how the crop disturbances only would be uh, compensation would only be calculated when would actually be uh, resu calculated. That's not right because some of them would like to rehouse early. However, they have a uh, crops planted at new in the farm and some see that they are entitled to the crop compensation and st they stayed on until it it their their very last minute should be rehoused well since the crop disturbance allows or the government has set aside money for that anyway it's just a matter of paying uh, now or the later periods can you have the flexibility for the remaining phase if they already indicated we'd like to be rehoused so maybe the AFCD uh, can settle with them early to deal with the uh, crops compensation payment and respond to members for the affected occupants even though it's in subsequent phases in waiting phases allow them to uh, leave early for a farm that we like to uh, early we haven't have such arrangements in place well if an occupant farmer have a squatter and we like to leave the squatter and also that means leaving the farmland that our crop compensation can be released early too next Mr. Ray Chan well, my question is quite similar to Mr. Lockwalk fan. In my round, I'm asking on the compensation on uh, crops and food and fruit trees. I think um, the permit secretary response uh, seems to be promised whatever they can. The residents have told me that would you be do set one thing and do another and failing to deliver. I don't want to level such a serious accusations. The, I, I hope that it's really due to a misunderstanding. For example, uh, the crop compensation payment can actually be calculated and settled early. For the question in previous round, some claim that the Lens Department staff told them that for the remaining phases that were not. Uh, account the crops of the villages the worst scenario they have to wait till 2024 to calculate the compensation amount as a herd that uh, that uh, the occupants and the farmers are different so if they volunteer and leave early then you will t take stock of their inventory and uh, in the past you might say that uh, the policy wasn't clear and the front line staff will say oh we don't know uh, so now you should tell us you will take stock and you will calculate the compensation as soon as possible rather than waiting till 2024 but the farmers will they have to wait till 2024 their turn before you calculate it chairman first of all uh, you need to understand when we do such a large resettlement we will have unforeseen circumstances occurring or especially when we are focusing on phase one I cannot rule out uh, some subsequent cases where we have not made it very clear or have not even thought about it especially uh, the frontline workers might never have thought through it so that is not surprising but please rest assured if we have a preliminary view and we have responded formally we will convey the message and i will take these frequently asked questions and place it on the web I'll make it easy for the affected residents now going back to the situation as a matter of fact if you are affected by subsequent works 
but you wish to leave early, we will handle the application. This pledge has been extended to the affected residents, and that still stands. Now, for farmers or business operators who wish to leave early and want uh, the ex gratia payment early, well, we don't have that pledge right now because we need to focus our resources and staff. But just now, the situation you mentioned, if a resident is a farmer, if they are willing to leave, then why can't we compensate their seedlings? And uh, It's reasonable to do it at the same time, so that's why I said just now, that's how we should handle it, and we will follow up. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell the residents so that even though some frontline staff said they would not take inventory, I urge you to make that request again. If they contradict the secretary, uh, you can uh, notify us. F Fernando Chang, a lot of elderly have attended the meeting today. They have convened a senior citizen concern group. Uh, they said that the elderly affected in the first phase of works, there are some transition arrangements, and they can choose uh, to be resettled in Bosek Wuchun, and that is a grade A housing society unit. And the later groups don't have a choice. The Ba Olo uh, settlement estate is a grade B and they have to pay grade B rent. S so the Batwa Road, the dedicated resettlement estate, could it be all grade A? You shouldn't f force them to divide the village into grade A and B and have a differential treatment. Well, first of all, the dedicated resettlement estates, why they are grade B rent, because from beginning to end, these are non-means tested residents. We understand. After so many rounds of discussions, legislators have proposed some residents uh, they are eligible for grade A rent. They meet the means testing for housing authority estate, but they want to, to be settled with their neighbors in the same housing estate. So could these households be charged a grade A rent? We are now exploring this with the housing society, but if legislators say all non-means tested households have to be grade A rent, then th the rationale might have changed. Why do we have a non-means tested? It's because we want to cater to households who don't meet the non-means test, but then they have to pay a lower rent, so we need to strike a balance. So they are eligible, but you want to live with your neighbors so we feel we have uh, grounds for discussing with the housing society mr gary fan i'd like dsd to answer the polishing plant the the recycling plant well hong kong has land uh, uh, northern district does use the dongjiang water to, as flushing water and uh, dongjiang water after it is disinfected, uh, then it becomes a potable water, and that involves uh, public resources. It's you answered we cannot compare it, but we can compare the cost efficiency. So please answer my previous question, DSD. Well, you can look at it this way: the water polishing facility 
it has to deliver 190,000 liters and it has to discharge it into Haohaiwan. So whether it can be recycled water, they have to do three stages of processing. So after three stages of processing, we see an opportunity where the WSD can process it further and convert it into recycled water. So it's different if you take sewage treatment and discharge it and compare that to Dongjiang, it's not reasonable. Have you converted into recycled water? You have to uh, go through three processes. It has to comply with EIA. Ch Chairman, I just asked a question. The FC needs to ask a cost question. This is the finance question. Why are they not answering? If you look at the construction costs, I'm asking the converting it to recycled water, what is the cost per cubic meter? I'm not asking about costs. I, it's a very clear question. I'd like to continue. We have two figures in the document. One is the construction costs, and you can refer to paragraph 10. It also talks about recurrent expenses. 319 million, that is uh, the expenditure per year. So is it so simple? You take the 319 million and divide it by the total uh, sewage output? I had explained that just now. Perhaps you could give us a written response. Uh, in the first round, I asked the sewage treatment we agree uh, it's just a matter of cost there are two parts to cost the construction costs and the facility costs it is close to 12 billion and you also have recurrent expenditure in paragraph 10 uh, more than 300 million the technologies include uh, some nanotechnology and another technology you said that under different circumstances they will be deployed separately so could you tell us the osmosis technology you know, what is the difference in cost and do you have similar construction costs for comparison in, including the water polishing uh, i didn't hear <coughs> the comparison so is this uh, is this something totally new that you can't compare? And third, you claim that the expenses are increasing because of the topology. So is it the, the civil engineering that uh, led to increase in expenditure or because of the civil engineering so can it, if we slightly increase the foothold will it significant reduce significantly the expenses and lastly the development bureau has a cost control unit so what role have they played in this project? Have they brought costs down or, <clears throat> or, uh, or we, do we only have one or two contractors who are uh, able to take uh, the job and uh, the cost control unit uh, is effectively meaningless? Well, regarding land use, the existing water treatment facility takes up 9.4 hectares and every day it handles 13,000 cubic meters and we're now increasing the population to 600,000 
and every day we need to deal with 190,000 cubic meters. So, and we are only requiring an extra 2.5 hectares. You can imagine that the, the, the it is much very complex. That you can imagine, if on the existing site we get an extra 9.4 hectares and build a new facility before we demolish the old facility. It, uh, this is cheaper, but you need to understand if in the whole NDA our land is very scarce so we want to use it for housing, we cannot find an extra 9.4 uh, or 10 plus hectares f to build a w sewage treatment facility. This goes against our original intention for housing, and we would need to resume more land. You need to take note, we don't need to resume land. It won't affect the residents. And because of such land constraints, we need to use two technologies. The first technology, uh, the bio-osmosis, is more expensive, but it uses less land. It is more efficient, so we try. We're trying to strike a balance. Some of the treatment will use a bioosmosis method. Uh, the second part will need more land. It uh, it is a lower uh, technology, so it's also cheaper. So we have tried to strike a balance, and you can rest assured that this has been vetted by the cost control unit. Uh, you can continue. So you've after going through the cost control exercise, how much uh, how much have you been able to reduce? I don't have the information on hand, but looking at the first and second estimate, overall speaking, I want to say we have reduced the costs and we have submitted uh, this for to the cost control unit. I want to know how much you were able to save after going through the cost control unit, which part were you able to save and what's the savage savings percentage? I don't have the actual figures. I don't want to give you an inaccurate answer. Uh, you, you should provide a written response. Uh, we don't mind the government deploying different methods to control costs, but you shouldn't just give us a blanket statement. Now, you have a, an osmosis technology and a moving platform technology. So the qualified contractors who can submit a tender, how many are there? There might only be one contractor, then there's no bargaining power, right? Well, there won't be just one or two contractors who can do the job because we have a contractor's list and according to the contractor's list, the eligible contractor, how, how many eligible contractors do you have in your list? There are 12 in the list. So they had successfully bid for projects in Hong Kong. They had gone through a vetting process. They had been admitted uh, into the uh, eligible contractors list. Then you need to submit the cost savings achieved by the cost control unit. And another area you have not answered is past records for uh, similar projects. Uh, do you have no records at all? Chairman, I said just now 
the second Wu Hoi sewage treatment facility is the first large facility where they are do using a three step process. We don't have a project of a similar scale for comparison. Well, uh, we've had eight and a half hours of discussion and 40 members asking 115 times. I think it's times almost up. Uh, if anybody else wishes to speak, I'll have to draw the line after that. Jihai Dick, Fernando John, Gary Fans, and Jishun Gokake, and Jeremy Tam. I'll give you two minutes. You only have one minute left. We'll have to draw the line there. Mr. Eddie Chu, I'll give you, you only have one minute. Thank you, Chairman. You shouldn't think that uh, it's useless uh, when we ask a short question, but we can follow up. As the Secretary said, th there is a possibility that they will neglect something because they are focused on building. So the, they are not aware of uh, the non-crucial items. The Secretary said that uh, the special rehabilitation uh, projects are in the Northern District, so even if they relocate to Bosak, it, uh, it shouldn't uh, disturb their farming activities. Well, I have a map here. Uh, we have an area in Mokwu, it's near the border, and uh, there's no public transport there. Well, either you drive there or you take a taxi. If you're living in Bosak, well, how can you farm? There's only 1.32 hectares set aside there. So the Development Bureau is out of touch with reality. That's why I insist on farming and residential um, combined. Uh, otherwise, how can they rehabilitate farming? Now, a second point you need to respond. We have not talked about the Longyun Ecological Park. Uh, we've spent billions to resume land, and uh, uh, setting that aside, uh, please, in Longyun Ecological Park, we have dozens of households, uh, they are growing rice, and they have a management agreement with the Conservancy Agency. So uh, maintaining their uh, farming and uh, housing needs with the NGO is the best method. But now the government has resumed the land and uh, has driven them away. And in the Long Park, uh, the Southwest, you are give, building temporary housing. So the question is, we, the principle should be you should not disturb people when possible. They have lived there for decades. Well, hey. So for that long valued nature park, nobody has talked about it. Um, there are households living there and they are farming there. So can you allow them to continue living there? You don't demolish the houses and then build container housing for them and they I only have 150 square feet to live in. Well, for Long Valley, why is it turned into a nature park? Because it is a very important wetland. Because we are carrying out constructions nearby and they will be affected. So other than compensating the affected wetland, we also want to enhance the value of the wetland. So AFCD will be uh, managing the um, area. As for the detailed arrangements, now for the farmers there, they do not need, need to leave. They have the priority to remain in the wetland park. Well, they don't have a house, they can leave there, don't mislead the public. You demolish their houses. I'm not misleading. We Well, to be frank, we don't have a policy to allow people to live where they farm. Now, if the wetland value has to be enhanced, if you live inside, if there are households there, it's not appropriate. 
So there is a reason behind that. Dr. K.K. Kwok, well, I think the um, government is squandering a lot of money on this infrastructural project. So look at the um, Telling Bypass, four kilometers only, and $4.2 billion will be built on that. So almost $1 billion on one kilometer of highway. So this is just a short four kilometer bypass. Why are we spending $4 billion on that? Is that the government standard? $1 billion for one kilometer of highway? CEDD. I remember at the last meeting, I already explained about this. Now, for the four kilometer felling bypass, is mainly uh, via that. Uh, three kilometers uh, via that, and se there are several hundred meters uh, underground. So the structure would be a bit more expensive. We've looked at the price, and it, we have taken reference from other uh, works contracts. Which one? For example, in Tong Hang Yun Wai uh, contract. So the estimated cost is $4.2 billion. You have taken reference from the Lian Tong project. So if we take um, cost overrun into account, eventually it may be 5 or $6 billion. Now for the Lian Tong project, there's no cost overrun. And for this uh, $4.2 billion is MOD price. So the tendering price would be lower than $4.2 billion, right? Yes, because we would uh, make adjustments according to the cost. So the contractor can eventually um, get this $4.2 billion in his pocket. This is our projection. So the tenderer will eventually get up your $4.2 billion. Why is this so strange? Because uh, we will have to provide breakdowns of um, the construction costs for FCs. I remember the Development Bureau once um, said that the contracts should be um, broken up into smaller ones so that the cost won't be so high. Next, Mr. Jeremy Tam. Please turn on uh, K. Kwok's microphone. So how many contracts are under this uh, four-kilometer highway? For the uh, first stage, we will have seven works contracts. So they are all separated. Um, they won't be done by one tenderer. So yes, there will be seven contracts. So you just divide $4.2 billion by seven. So each one will be $600 million. Chairman, maybe I didn't make myself clear. For, I mean that for the first stage, uh, projects, we will have a total of seven contracts. As for the Fanning Bypass East section, it will be divided into two contracts. Mr. Jeremy Tam, I want to ask a question about Article 41, Appendix 7, uh, Paper Number 41, article, um, Appendix 7. My question is about B and C. That is about environmental monitoring and audit cost and uh, site workers cost. So for the footnote three and four, there are some differences. For footnote three, you say that you will pick a consultant and then you will know um, how many work months are needed. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. And after the construction is completed, you will know the uh, worker course and um, engineering course. So after the um, tenderer has won his award, actually he sh um, the C and B should be handled in the same manner. But what you are doing now is um, you are doing C but not doing D. Why is that? Why there are two sets of standards? So for one is 
um, that uh, when you get the tender, you should give me an estimate. But for D is after the works are completed, you will know the cost. Who's going to answer the question? For footnote three, for um, this is um, the estimates that we used for contractor uh, or used for consultant contracts. So after we get a um, consultant, we would know the details. And the, for the other one is for our site supervisors. So we have to come to the final stage of the works. Then we will know the um, needs of the uh, sites and the uh, number of workers. Mr. Ray Chen, I have a comment and a question. As for my comment, it's about animals. Now, when you demolish the villages, it is very likely that a lot of people will abandon their pets. And uh, we call on you to allow the pets to be taken to uh, public housing. And also, uh, we hope that NGOs can help. But it seems that the government doesn't want to get involved. You don't want to spend resources. So later on, I'll move a 37A motion. I hope the government will set up a specific fund for animal NGOs so that they can help um, the animals in these NDAs. I hope members can support me. I have a question. Now, for the remaining phase, if the farmers move out earlier, the government would resume their structures. Then the um, farmers would have no electricity or water. So without electricity or water, how can they continue to um, do farming? For the second question, well, if there are cases like this, we will have to handle them in a reasonable manner. If a farmer is rehoused in a in um, a public housing estate, but he still uh, wants to farm on his site until the construction reaches his site, then um, that's different from the earlier question. The earlier question is that he leaves his farmland. So if he still wants to farm and his farmland, we should allow him to do so because the construction hasn't reached his site yet. So please uh, believe me, we will try to handle these cases in a reasonable manner. But uh, we will have to wait till the real case um, happens, then we will um, look at the situation. So if there's a real suspension of power and water, you will make compensations? We normally won't allow the suspension of electricity and water if um, it is not up to the stage that he has to leave his farmland. Fernando Zhang, I have two questions. First, we heard from the villagers. Well, actually, uh, we received 30 pages of questions from the villagers. I hope the governments can promise me this. That is, for these 30 pages of questions, please reply to them in writing. Of course, after the meeting, I'll hand over these questions to you. Yes, we can do that. This is very important. And secondly, I'm concerned about the elderly. No matter whether it's uh, the first stage or the remaining phase, or those elderly people living at Dills Corner Garden Retirement Home, is there an office which they can call? about future arrangements. Do you have a telephone number where they can ask questions? Do you have a hotline? P.S. Well, the Lens Department has such a telephone number. We will uh, 
publicize the number so that the elderly would know. But uh, we also encourage the elderly to liaise with the social workers. When the social workers get questions from them, um, they will talk to us. But of course, we can adopt a tool prone approach. So for the elderly at Joe's uh, Corner Garden, I don't think they have a lot of connections with the lens department. Can the social welfare department also provide such a service? That is, there should be a dedicated uh, telephone number. If they have any questions concerning the future arrangements or how they should move to another retirement home, etc., there should be a point where they can contact. Yes, we will talk to the SWD. I think um, SWD will be willing to do that. Gary Fan. Chairman, I have several questions about reclaimed water. I hope um, the WSD can give me an answer after the meeting. I am most concerned about the um, how rehousing uh, house estate. Now, um, most of these villages are old. It will be very painful that they have to move to a new place. I hope um, government officials won't have to face such painful experience in the future. Now they are going to be rehoused in either HS or HA at stays, and they will be charged a Class B rent, that is half of the um, normal rent. So I hope the government would answer this question again clearly. Chairman, please give me 20 more seconds. Please look at the financial means. Please remember that they are old people. They have been um, living in the villages for a very long time. Can they be rehoused in Class A rent, HS or HA public housing units so that they won't be under such great pressure? Chairman, a piece of information. For HA's uh, dedicated uh, state, even though um, is they even though they charge them um, Type P rents, they are highly subsidized housing. Yes, that's half of the uh, market rent. Some households uh, will actually pass the HA's means test. So we will talk to the HS. We hope that they can pay Class A rent. So for the um, these households who will be affected, they don't have to go through means test. But if you say that we should allow all of them to pay one quarter of um, market rent um, at the present. We cannot do it, but we will try our best to be compassionate and lenient. For those who are eligible for lower rent um, at the HA, we will um, talk to the HS. Now we have two 37A motions. The first one is moved by Mr. Ray Chen. Please read it out. In accordance with Rule 37A of the EFC rules, I move that um, in PWC 2018 appendix, the government has not explained to us what will happen to the uh, pets in Kutung North and Felling North NDAs. We ask that the government to provide an additional Funding under 37 CA um, had 701. This is to subsidize animal welfare organizations so that they can take care of the pets who cannot uh, move into public housing with their owners. Okay, um, we have a total of two 37A motions.
好啦，大家留意我哋而家即将表决。Okay, we're now whether to deal with the 37A motion. <音樂>好啦，现在开始表决。Voting begins. Enjoy the results. Voting is stopped. Please show the results. For 16430 against zero abstentions, the committee will not deal with this motion. Next, we have a motion by Mr. Eddie Chu. Okay, we claim division. Bell will run for five minutes. This committee see that while developing the Northwest New Territories, the government should adopt the principle of minimal disturbance to villages. Thus, we should slightly amend the rehousing and development arrangement as follows. First, allow the Long Valley Nature Park farmers to as live in, at the same, in situ. And um, for the affected farmers and the agriculture park and this, those a special agricultural land rehabilitation scheme to provide a two story 400 square meters a standard f farming shed in exchange of not uh, rehousing the farmers on uh, holly housing yet at the same time to provide the rehabilitation farming and crop compensation for the first and remaining stage of the affected farmers
知喎，我我本來要跟你，佢做咩光啊？好咗好淡對，頸誒、呃、你知我我手手頸啊嘛，我手頸啊嘛。So deal with the 30 second A motion that would see the members agree to deal with this motion at all. Voting begins. Let's show the results. Four, 17 for 31 against zero abstentions. So the committee will not deal with this motion. Without further questions, we we'll now put FCR 2019-23 to a vote. For those who agree, please put your hand. Okay, someone claim a division. The bell rang for five minutes.
我睇睇大家咧，我即將表決咧就係係咪 ？Members, we are voting on whether we shall approve the funding of thirty-two billion dollars for the Kutong North development. Before we vote, I would like to take this opportunity. I'd like to thank Prime Minister Secretary Bernadette Ling of、uh, answering questions with me undertaking and able to、um, provide answer in addressing their needs. I hope that you can teach your colleagues a class so that you can make the government officials to better answer our questions. Voting begins. Voting stop. Please show the result. Thirty-five for twelve against zero abstentions. I declare the proposal is endorsed. Thank you. Next item, FCR eighteen nineteen eighty-eight. The item invite members to approve with effect on first of January twenty twenty. The proposed enhancement on the remuneration package for members of district council, a new commitment of sixty. One million seven hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars under subhead general non-recurrent for reimbursing for setting and wider expenses for district council members of the twenty twenty to twenty twenty-three term. And the Home Affairs Bureau had consulted the Home Affairs Panel. And we spent one hour and six minutes on the ESC panel. Today we have a、uh, Cheshua, Director of Home Affairs, and the Assistant Director of HAD of Mr. Yam Hung Wa, Howard Yam. And can we have a、uh, Mr. Kwok Wei Kang, the Chair of the Home Affairs Panel, to report on this proposal? The Home Affairs Panel on the January twenty eight, twenty nineteen, discussed the government's proposal to im. Enhance the district council's remuneration and allowances. The members generally support the proposal. However, some members suggest that the administration should allocate more resources to district councils to meet with the expenditure of need to renting private premises and、um, opening ward offices and hire enough manpower. Other members suggest the government to consider providing government premises for members to rent and ward offices. And some. Members hope that the government can enhance the severance payment and long-term service payment calculation of a council assistance, as well as the offsetting arrangement. As the government proposed to propose abolishing the one-third deduction of non-accountable on Mariam on members who are concurrently members of Exco and Legco members, members express support and see these arrangements. Is an acknowledgement on the contribution of the district councillors. The members have not object. The governments submit the relevant proposal for the finance committee scrutiny. Thank you, Mr. Jeremy Tan. Five minutes. What point of order you wish to raise? Can you have Mr. Al has the microphone? 
Well, this uh, was so unique. Well, as seen, uh, quite relevant to the electrical members who are also uh, district council members with a direct or pecuniary interest. While dealing with this agenda item, do we need to recuse ourselves? And I see the secretariat. I also provide a list of logical members who are also district councillors. So I wish we get the clarification. Well, that doesn't mean that I'm running. I thought that you, you thought you issue uh, in the well. What we're discussing is for the next four year DC term, and I don't think anyone is confident enough that they would definitely win and elect it. So you can declaration, however, you can use it if you like. For, but uh, to me, I don't think declaration is required. So it's really for the next term of DC Council, but not relevant to this term. Mr. Jeremy Tan, five minutes. And uh, page eight in, in page 20. So if I increase it to uh, two thousand dollars, and for transfer allowance and also for a uh, personal study arrangements, I don't you don't have to provide an accountable or provide in receipts. So let's say if you increase to seven six nine zero, the part of this money can be for our private studies, and and do need to provide an invoice. Or the receipts to the government. Not needed because the 7690 per month is a non accountable amount. As long as, as it is used for uh, self development and travel expenses, as long as it's within that amount. Well, for self development, In the past, you have no idea that how much the council have spent on transport or self development. Then, how do you know that there's a rise, there is a rising need for self development? We have conducted four focus group meetings and also I do a survey on the allowance and from the response of service members the expenditure is about one to two thousand dollars on the traveling allowance and also can be uh, used for uh, self-development so I think together we uh, propose a two thousand dollar lump sum increase so their travel exp expense is just about one to two thousand dollars well for the feedback we get is about one to two thousand dollars. For the rest, they'll be for self development. Yes. Have you also asked them because in principle their self development must be related to the functions as a DC member? Have we done a survey to ask the kind of course that they took? Director Chair? Since it's not accountable as a miscellaneous expenses reimbursement, so it did not request the receipts. And for the self development courses, will this be up to the member whether uh, that can they need if they decided not to uh, use this not a Accountable, so they also do so by the operating expenses. May I suggest that if we decide to launch that? Well, I'm I'm no idea whether I'll be here in a few years' time. Well, for self development, should it be uh, take it out and become accountable? I believe it's fair enough. It was really for tra traveling. Well, uh, it shouldn't be accountable because you just can't declare a few doubts at a time and make that part non-accountable and don't need receipts. 
if you separate the two for the next DC term is really for a personal study is okay to offer more because they're probably not able to claim the full amount. And now for well for the transport expenses is rising and some of the members drive themselves and even cost more. I see you could just let it stay. So would you consider well in the past have you ever considered in making the self development uh, allowance and make it accountable to make as a portion of the seven six nine no I've been okay for a higher amount because if what they learn we're able to plow back to the community. However, you uh, separate the traveling expenses and self development. We will take the suggestion and convey it to the independent committee. Did anybody mention this before? Or oh, is this the first time you heard this suggestion? This is the first time we've introduced the travel subsidy and the self-development non-accountable remuneration. So it's the first. Mr. Tan Jichun. Thank you, Chairman. The suggestion, uh, I will support most of them because it's very difficult to be a consular in Hong Kong. Uh, whether it's a district council or legislator, the salary is on the low side. Unless you are a big political party where they have fundraising abilities. In point A, that is an ex co member or the abolishing the one third reduction in non accountable honorarium for DC members with concurrent membership as executive council and or legislative council members. Now, even though it's a future arrangement, uh, but in my camp we have three mem three members who serve on three different bodies. So these double membership uh, colleagues, uh, their situation is not ideal. It could be a structural problem. For example, uh, our alleged co meetings on Wednesday, Thursday, and might run into the afternoon. And some district council council meetings are also on Thursday. So if you go to a district council meeting, you cannot vote on important uh, matters. Uh, for example, the the budget uh, would require three, four weeks. And if you want to sit in LegCo, then you can't go to the district council meetings. Now, I've done some statistics, and I'm not going to talk about individuals. Uh, I'm not going to talk about in Kuntao. We have a member in the first nine months. His attendance for council meetings was 75%. He participated in four panels, and three were attendance were less than 50%. In FC uh, and four meetings, he only attended once. Uh, the explanation was that uh, they uh, coincide with the Thursday LegCo extended meeting. So there's nothing much you can review or balance. The one-third reduction, uh, that is the mechanism. It's overlapping. But in the future, in the next term, this mechanism won't be in place. The attendance, is it the only measuring stick? Well, you can also let the public decide. Uh, you can attend once out of three months in uh, Alechko, and that would have fulfilled the basic requirement. I'm not familiar with district council. They might have check-in, check-out times, but those are only records. It's in some committees, they might require you to leave if your attendance is not uh, up to par. Uh, we have uh, the traditional DC functional constituency. We also have the super councils. There is no mechanism to deal with this, and I feel it is inappropriate. 
in essence, there is a deficiency. Our paper, we mention uh, dual membership, and the public may have uh, high expectations. And there's also a saying that if you reduce their non accountable honorarium, it is diminishing their contribution to the district council. Now, from 1st of January 2016 to 31st of July 2018, uh, DC councillors and alleged co councillor uh, legislators, their attendance was on average 92%. Now, if on average, if they participate in the DC committees and the average attendance in DC committee time. Uh, it was 79%. Well, yes, you also need to compare their attendance in LegCo and their voting uh, in LegCo. Now, I will support the paper, Mr. Laogokfan. Thank you, Chairman. Of course, DAB supports the paper. A lot of the content uh, we had consulted DC councillors and uh, government officials had interacted with DC councillors and district councillors have a heavy workload uh, District councillors are the first people residents uh, approach. They have heavy financial burden and work burden. Uh, Mr. Tandishin said some councillors uh, are f paying out of their own pocket to, to do this job. If they uh, employ another assistant, they are actually subsidizing this out of their own pocket. If Hong Kong wants a stable and a quality platform uh, to encourage people to join political work, then reasonable remuneration should be uh, paramount, whether it is salary or travel subsidy. I'm not saying this is the best, but but uh, it should be a step forward. So, uh, it's unfortunate that rents are very high in Hong Kong. Of course, if you rent government premises, the burden would be lighter. But in the private sector, the accountable um a reimbursement is uh, forty thousand but uh if you include the assistant salary of thirteen thousand to fifteen thousand that will use up uh, the almost the whole remuneration and we c constantly hear counselors saying they cannot retain staff in a a year's time, the assistants will have learnt the ropes and leave for greener pastures. So, would you have a better mechanism to deal with this? For example, I mentioned there's a average figure uh, for a rental unit, and if you rent a private from the private sector, there should be some. Uh, subsidies to make up for the shortfall well we've heard of rental subsidy and then on the last two cons occasions we've considered that now we feel that allowing more flexibility to use the money in the operating fund 
We have 281 consulars who are renting in from the private market, and the we also have some statistics on the subsidy. The 181 private offices, on average, uh, the rent is ten thousand dollars. Now each di district is different. The office rent is different in the different districts. The councillors have different needs. How they use the operating fund on the assistance salary and rent. The uh, ratios are different. So if we were to set a specific amount for rent, then it might uh, be not fair to the 218 councillors who are renting from the private sector. It would reduce their flexibility and they would also get less from the operating fund. In the past, we have reviewed the operating fund because of rent uh, increases. In 2014, we uh, significant, significantly increased it to 34%. Mr. Aulokim. DC councillors and LegCo legislators, uh, it's a difficult job. Now, if you ask me, on I I find it hard to vote on this uh, agenda on this item. It, it feels like there is some direct or indirect pecuniary interest, but I do have a few questions. First of all, in 2013, the government conducted a review on remuneration and subsidy, but it wasn't comprehensive. There was only incremental increases, but there was no overall plan. Just now, some colleagues said uh, uh, they cannot rent premises. Uh, in some districts, you can't you can't uh, draw the lots for housing department. The uh, the government uh, has sold off its malls to link reit and everybody has to pay higher rents so the increase cannot offset uh, the rent increases so have you compared to uh, other uh, subsidies uh, we need to have a comprehensive plan that's the first question and second I notice in paragraph 2C, the government is using the median monthly employment earnings uh, as a reference, but the counselor assistants, they meet with the public, they do a lot of networking work, but uh, the salary is on the low side. So. Can the government not use clerical support workers as reference and uh, use a more comprehensive uh, reference for a future reference? First of all, the district councilor work, it's very hard to make a comparison. Now, uh, counselor assistants, uh, the work is very unique, but after making reference to many indices and according to the non-accountable expenditure, it seems like it matches the median monthly earnings of clerical support workers and this is just one indicator we refer to we also look at operating expenses such as rent and uh, past claims they've made and we can say that 
we have not looked beyond Hong Kong because the community work is very unique and Hong Kong is different from other jurisdictions. In Hong Kong, only 54% of counselors are full time. Now, in, this is different from full time counselors in other jur jurisdictions. Just now, Mr. Ao mentioned difficulties in identifying premises. Now, the majority of counselors, according to our records, are using private premises or they have uh, offices in housing estates. Uh, only a very small portion uh, of counselors don't have offices. And some district councillors also decide not to have an office. They use the internet to communicate or they rely on the telephone. I just want to add, I believe a lot of counselors are juggling resources and uh, because rent is so expensive, they cannot afford an assistant. So my point is, is it really the case we cannot make reference to other jurisdictions? Of course, their counselor's workload might not be t uh, exactly the same, but there should be some reference value. I keep telling the media that our counselors get 30000 a month, uh, but some uh, neighboring countries' uh, pay is almost double. Ms. Helena Wong. In 2A, it refers to concurrent membership as executive council and legislative council members, non accountable honorarium. In the past, uh, one uh, they were able to. A, get a one-third reduction and now it's being abolished. What is the reason? What is the reasoning for that? Are you trying to encourage concurrent membership? Are, are you encouraging people to even have a triple membership? In paragraph 8, 9, 10, we've explained that As a concurrent member, it does not obstruct them uh, or does not uh, reduce their commitment. In fact, the public have higher expectations. If you were to abolish the honorarium, it would diminish their contribution. So this is our consideration. So we've taken their requests and opinion and submitted it to an independent committee and we feel that we should not uh, reduce their one-third of their honorarium. Just now the government said district councillors, uh, full-time district councillors are only 54 percent the majority. The, uh, we have a substantial amount of part-time councillors. I've heard why can't they work full time? Because uh, the salary cannot. The salary is not enough to feed a family. That's why they need to work part time. So I want to ask the government Does the government have a plan to? reform the work and function of uh, district council it is a consultative body uh, their resources and authority are limited we now have abolished the urban council and the municipal council so should the government review the structure should they expand 
the console's geographic boundaries and also ex increase their functions. Is there such a plan? The role of the district council, its function is spelt out in Article 97 of the Basic Law. It also needs to comply with the district council rules. So under the Basic Law and district council ordinances, the work it's not an executive function, it's consultative in nature, but it's very important because on a lot of important topics, uh, they has to be discussed in the district council. And for a lot of local issues, DC's views are very important. And when it comes to um, district programs and uh, public works, DCs are also playing a very important role. So the value of DC would not be a factor by its not having a uh, policy making power and views of DCs have always been respected. Under the basic law and the district council ordinance, we now do not have plan to change the roles of DCs. I hope the HAB can talk to the um, Constitutional and Mainland Affairs Bureau. An in-depth study should be carried out. The public should be consulted. I think DCs can do more in terms of the district work and their contribution to policy making. In the past 30 years, the government has not seriously uh, nurtured DCs so that they can be training grounds for um, administrators and counselors. Next, uh, Dr. Chen Chong Tai. For the paper, last time the honorarium was um, adjusted, it was um, in 2016. Now we are doing it again. So in terms of policy, as the government considered this, that is for DC members honorarium and the subsidies for the award offices, can there be a mechanism to adjust these um, on a yearly basis, or you are just doing it um, every three years? In 2014, there were some controversies. At that time, the CE was Siwai Leung, and he allocated an amount of money for DCs. And there were criticisms saying that he actually was trying to, uh, it was a political buyout. So can you have a mechanism that is the honoraria of DC members can be adjusted every year instead of every two to three years? Well, we have two mechanisms. At the beginning of each term, or one year before the beginning of each term, an independent commission would review the uh, remunerations and um, operating expenses of DC members. And each year, we will look at the CPI, Consumer Price Index, to make adjustments. This year, we have fine tuned the CPI mechanism and in the past, we just uh, used the figure in November, the inflation figure in November each year. But uh, from now on, we would calculate the annual adjustment rate based on a change in the average CPI for the 12 months ending November of a year compared with the average CPI A for the preceding 12 month period. So the independent commission has uh, fine tuned this. And so there are two adjustment mechanisms. So this is about 12 A and B, and paragraph 13, the honorarium uh, level and 
Um, DC members on the Royal was last enhanced in 2016 by a real increase of 15%. So every year you will look at the CPI to make the adjustment, right? Some DC members says that now they have to wait for the Independent Commission's review, and uh, we are following up on the review here. So they are asking this question. That is, um, can it not be done every three years? For the Independence Commission, each year before a term, they will conduct a review. The reason is that they hope that the remuneration package can attract people from different walks of life. If they want to serve the people, then they would have a clear understanding of what remuneration package they will have in the coming term if they have decided to become BC members and serve the communities. So every time before the beginning of a new term, we want to give a clear picture um, for the prospects. So um, that's why the review is done every four years. And as I said just now, well, DC members now have uh, their remuneration packages, and this is paid by um, public money. But DC members are not employees of the government, so it's not like we can increase their wages every year. So if we look at it from this perspective, and actually the focus is about uh, DC members' ward offices. So, in terms of remuneration, there has been an established mechanism. Then, for the ward office, I think there should be an independent mechanism. And now you have an independent commission and is responsible for uh, reviewing the remuneration packages. So, can you? Uh, take out the office part so that the commission won't be looking at everything, including um, the expenditure on what offices. But the Independence Commission would look at the remuner remuneration uh, package and operating expenses. But for rents, it won't rise every four years. You have to look at the market on a yearly basis. Well, if uh, for wages you cannot adjust it this way, then you should at least look at the rents because their rental level may increase every year. It's very difficult for them. So can you take out the rental parts and review the rents level every year? Uh, for operating expenses, we take reference from the CPIA. I understand Dr. Cheng's comments. You are saying that uh, CPIA's increased rates may not be the same as the rental increase rates. The Independent Commission has discussed this. So at the last review, we saw the differences. So in uh, 2014, the um, operating fund was increased by 34 percent. The um, commission has looked at all the data. And they have also um, checked the rental expenses in the past year. Well, in terms of um, the operating expenses, we do not have a specific fund for rents. Do all the DC members spend the operating expenses on rents? Um, um, that's not necessarily so. So if we um, cut out the rental parts, it will reduce flexibility for DC members. Mr. Hawkeming, I've been following up on, on this for many years because I was the chairman of Councillors' Assistance. And now I even have to um, take money out of my pocket to pay my assistance, and my I dare not let my wife know. I hope she's not watching TV. 
just now the director um, say that some DC members would use electronic means and it's cheaper. Well, now, well, I want to um, put together reports for Guy Fong's and each time it costs seven thousand dollars but each month I only get four two thousand dollars or so as for the link um, it has increased my rent by thirty three percent originally I pay a rent of six thousand dollars now it's nine thousand dollars so it's thirty three percent so I Hope that the rental parts can really be carved out. It's very difficult for us to talk to the Independence Commission. I cannot find uh, those members, and they cannot meet with DC members all the time. So, can you really um, consider separating the rents? I really envy uh, Mr. Lok Chung Hong because um, his rent is um, just half of mine because he's renting uh, at a public housing estate. So I'm renting from the link is more expensive. If you are renting from a private building, I'm sure it will uh, the rent will even be higher. So I do not mind that it is accountable. I hope that our operating expenses would not be eroded by the high rents. Yes, I was at my kai phones all the time, but this is not the best way of doing it. Sometimes we have to give them physical things, but it's really very expensive. I think DC members ought to have to overcome this difficulty. So I hope that, um, Director, for the next term, maybe you won't be a director then, but I hope that the Independent Commission can really meet up with us more, talk to us more, so that they will know what the actual situation is. Otherwise, the increase in our uh, remuneration package and operating expenses uh, would not be realistic. Um, I remember uh, last time that was just an increase of 1%. That's really not enough. And, Director, you are saying that you will use a new formula. How much more percentage can we get? In the, in la well, last year and the year before last, um, there were only a 1% increase. For rents, yes, there were a lot of discussions. Before we conducted this review, we had held four focus group meetings. DC members gave us a lot of views, and we uh, relay such views to the Independent Commission. We uh, um, so the Commission understands that uh, DC members are very concerned about rents. And just now, Mr. Lau uh, also asked a question he has written us that question we also sent that question to the commission and a number of meetings were organized for different political parties so we have reflected all the views that uh, we've collected when um, the rental issue was discussed at the independent commission's meetings um, we found that it's really uh, very difficult to find a system that's applicable to all DC members. Only 181 DC members are now renting their offices in the private market, and their rental levels are all very different. It depends on the districts that they are in. So you just look at the average rent of that district. You can look at the uh, race, right? Yes, there are 18 districts, but there are smaller areas within these 18 districts. For example, central and western uh, districts. Well, the central, the rent in central is different from the rent in Kennedy Town. So we have to be very objective. So it's very difficult to come up with a reasonable uh, level that everyone is happy with. I just want to pay my rent. Now we still have six minutes left. 
if members want to vote on this item, then I will extend this meeting by 15 minutes. Does anyone object to this? We have Gary Fan, Elena Wong, and Mr. Kwok Wai Kang. So after these three members ask their questions, we will vote. First, Mr. Gary Fan. I want to declare my interest. I'm a Saikong DC member. This is the 19th year and that I'm a DC member, and until up to the end of this year will be the 20th year. I have never been able to find a place to uh, set up my office in my district. Uh, my um, voters have to go to another district to look for me. Although, well, and some DC members are even unable to set up an office. Uh, for example, the area they are serving may only have uh, private buildings so they can afford an office. So uh, we, we really have to speak for these people. So when it comes to setting up um, what offices, can you be more flexible? I have several proposals. Yes, we've been talking a lot about rents, but uh, some problems cannot be resolved in um, private residential building areas and where areas there are a lot of shopping malls is really very expensive to rent an office. So for DC members of these areas, if you can give them more subsidies, then they may be able to rent a small office. You won't believe our how small our office can be. Maybe we can just put two day two desks there. And even if you raise the subsidy, it doesn't mean that we can really get an office because sometimes they only have 1,000 square feet uh, premises uh, for renting to uh, chain stores. I hope the government can also talk to the um, housing society. But it's quite rare that they rent out their premises to DC members as ward officers. So can the government try to help us with this? The DC members are just trying to discharge their duties. This is accountable. They are not making any profits. You would say that uh, by doing so, it may reduce the Flexibility is nothing about flexibility. They don't even have a ward office. So what do we spend our um, money on? This on offices and um, hiring assistants. So that's why we need the support of public money. You have to change your mindset. Some. DC members cannot even set up offices. You should provide them with help. Otherwise, how can they help or serve the people? Mr. Fan suggests that we talk to HS. Uh, we will look into that. Helena Wong, four minutes. Chairman, A lot of members share the same view. That is, they are afraid that DC members do not have enough resources to set up what offices. Well, for um, Democratic Party, we also have some DC members who cannot find a place uh, for offices in their district. Now they is into their fourth year of into the fourth year of their term. So, how can you help? These DC members, it's not that they do not want to set up an office, it's that they cannot do it. They are unable to do it. So you have the figures, and what have you helped them? Well, we try our best to assist DC members to find premises in their own area. But um, sometimes they may not be able to do it. Well, we have 60 DC members who cannot set up their 
their offices within their own just uh, area. We will provide assistance to some of them. For example, we'll talk to Housing Society. Well, he may not be um, your own DC member, but um, can you try to help? Well, some DC members are still um, incapable of setting up an office, and we are still trying to help them. But sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, maybe it's because of the rent. So we will have to um, allow the DC member to decide for himself. Now, in Lychee Cork, there are a lot of new residential buildings, but the uh, shopping malls do not want to um, let out their premises to DC members. But these are all private residential buildings, so um, it's very difficult for the DC members to set up their offices there. We propose setting up container boxes below flyovers as what offices, and we will liaise with the land, how uh, lands, and the transport department. Well, we liaise with the, all the departments green lighted, and then the HAD just put and is clock there. Of course, some poor establishment camp farm members have also pulled tricks on us, so that we keep on consulting the residents and. It's uh, going nowhere. It have no impact to transport and so forth, uh, no congestion. So why wouldn't you allow the containers to be be placed in the constituencies in the ward offices? Well, other than providing a bit more money, you can't address the problem with ward offices. Would you? Uh, do some facilitation for the container reward offices so that the new DC term members can have this problem sorted. I don't count in specific cases. Uh, for the container reward offices, as said by Dr. Wang, we have conducted a second two rounds of public consultations. Uh, for, uh, there was a very vocal opposition. So it's not a matter of us allowing or not. Well, it's in a public space taken as a what offices, so we have to go through the consultation process. So who carried out by the consultation? Is it by yourself or by district organizations? Actually done by the district officers. Well, have someone have told me that we very much need a what offices, and also the residents have signed a petition. I can't read the details. So after two rounds of engagement, the number of objections have been uh, be, uh, uh, overwhelmed. The you uh, want so so is it you can rule it out in all applications for the ward offices, for district house members. Only two of those uh, are still require our follow up. How many DC members have told? You you and seeking your assistance for a container what offices, and how many of them approved and rejected? What, uh, currently, there are two DC members still as uh, looking for what offices, which we are helping out. If there are no other questions, we now put FCR 2018-9088 to a vote. For those who agree, please put up your hand. Objectors. I think most of the members present um, agreed with this proposal, and this is a motion. The item is passed. Thank you.